Welcome to this joint webinar organized by Keck and uh, the World Council of Churches. Welcome all participants. Uh, I am Anders Feirud, former Primate of Church of Sweden and now European President of the World Council of Churches. In times of fundamental changes, we easily become very short-sighted and often lock ourselves to our own limited perspectives. Today at this webinar, I'm sure we will meet many more perspectives, experiences and knowledge. At least that is what I hope. Also in Europe, people live under very difficult circumstances. Some of us are constantly reminded of the risks of lives by the lives they live. Others are not at all aware of this as they live lives that seem so protected and secure. Seem so protected and secure. But a little coronavirus changes it all. Those who knew of the risks are often the ones most badly hurt by the virus and COVID-19. Those of us who live protected lives often turn out to be the most frightened though we probably will fare far better than those who were used to risks. As it is said in Matthew 13, 12, to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. When Jesus said that, it was in a very different context. But here today, those words signal injustice. Our task this afternoon is to meet under the heading Justice and Peace. It is a privilege for me to introduce today's moderator. It is Dr. Jorgen Sko Sorensen. General Secretary of the CAC, the Conference of the European Churches. Please, Jorgen. Thank you very much, Bishop Weyruit. Um, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to uh, moderate this session. Uh, and as you said, uh, Bishop Weyruit, you said that we will have more perspectives and aspects on this uh, current health crisis uh, from our panelists today. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what will be shared with us and also to hear what kind of questions and comments will come up from our viewers this afternoon. I will uh, say uh, before we start uh, uh, with the panel panelists, I would say that we will have uh, three parts of our discussions this afternoon. Uh, first part with the uh, first half of our panelists um, uh, giving short introductions to their particular area of concern. Then we will have uh, an interview uh, with uh, Heather Roy. Then we will have a, a, a video uh, from uh, uh, the Church's Commission on Migrants in Europe. And after that, a second part of presentations uh, with four speakers from the panel. And the third part will be our panel discussion. And there we rely on questions coming from the viewers this afternoon. Um, I will say if you have questions uh, during the uh, during the, um, the sessions. Please let us know through the 
uh, chat session in Zoom, if you're watching via Zoom. If you're watching on YouTube, you can write your questions and comments uh, below the YouTube video. Um, and please be short and sharp in your comments and questions, and please address uh, or make sure that you write to whom you address your question. That will make it easier for us to get through the uh, question and answer session. But first of all, uh, just a few words on our panelists this afternoon. Uh, I would like to introduce to you the seven panelists as we, uh, we have uh, on screen this afternoon. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Heather Roy, General Secretary of Euro Diakonia, working in Brussels. Heather, could you raise your hand, please, so we can see who you are. Now you are there. Uh, you will speak or you will give an overview uh, uh, on COVID-19 as a disease of the poor and the social economic impacts of, uh, of the COVID-19. Then we have Reverend Hans-Peter Bocholt from Germany, if you will raise your hand. Uh, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Hannover, um, and you will speak about the impact on people with disabilities for us this, this afternoon. Thirdly, we have Father Stavros Kofinas from Greece, if you will raise your hand. There you are. Uh, you will speak on health and anti-vaccine propaganda. You will represent this afternoon uh, the network of the Ecumenical Patriarchate for Pastoral Healthcare. Philip Cori from UNICEF is also with us. Uh, you will in particular speak on the impact on children. You are representing UNICEF Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia this, uh, this afternoon. We have Nicole Borisuk from Germany, now living in Ukraine. You will speak on aspects of poverty related to COVID-19 crisis. Uh, you're heading a faith-based uh, NGO in Ukraine, Living Hope, and we'll speak from that perspective. Maria Sonnleitner from I, uh, EICE in Austria. Are you here? There you are. <laughs> uh, you will address the long-term consequences on young people and with uh, particular aspects of mental health in this crisis. And finally, we have uh, Richard Reddy from Bradford, England, speaking on black and minority ethnic communities, whether there's been a dispro disp uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on these communities. So seven speakers, plus a, a few other um, things we will have to uh, find time for within the next hour and a half. Uh, this means that it will be short, uh, sharp interventions from our speaker this, uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, I hope that I will be able to, uh, to maintain the time schedule that we have available, that is until 5.30 uh, Central European time. So we better get moving. Uh, and I would like, first of all, to give uh, the word to uh, Heather Roy, General Secretary of Euro Diakonia, and you will speak on the social and the economic impact. You will try to give us an overview of the situation. And I know you have some slides that you would share with us. I think they should be on screen in a few moments. Heather, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you very much, Jürgen, and good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you to both Keck and the World Council of Churches for organising the event this afternoon. I think it's a, a, a very timely event. Um, Eurodai Kenia, as many of you know, we have 52 members across Europe. We're working in 32 countries and territories, and we bring together the diaconal work of churches and Christian-based organisations around Europe. And when I was thinking about this afternoon and the topic, uh, I was wondering if really we're talking about COVID-19 being um, a disease of the poor, or is it really a disease of the vulnerable? And I say that because in Eurodiaconia, we bring together many organisations, diaconal organisations, church-related organisations that are providing social and healthcare services. And we have seen that it is not only about people who experience poverty, who are the hardest hit in our societies, or indeed, people in, in various other situations that other speakers will talk about, but also the impact that it's had on the, the ability to actually deliver services during this time. And on my next slide, I um, just wanted to, to highlight that we have seen um, quite an impact 
on the ability to provide diaconal care services because of the pandemic, because of the high risk, particularly to aged populations in long-term care um, facilities. But we've also seen an impact on other forms of social services run by diaconal organisations that have had to stop. So things like debt counselling, mental health support, childcare services, um, family-based uh, support, many of those services had to stop. And we've also, of course, seen the impact on the wider population. And whereas I think uh, I would agree that there has been a, a disproportionate effect on people at the lower social or economic uh, level in our societies, we also have to remember that it's often people who have been in the lowest paid work that have had to continue to work during the pandemic, who have continued to run our health and care services and our public services. So I think that we, we have to think carefully about it being whether it's a disease of the poor or a disease of the most vulnerable in our societies. And if I go on to uh, very quickly to my next slide, what we've seen as the socioeconomic impacts for service providers, there has been huge additional costs to our members to be able to provide the um, personal protective equipment that has been needed there has been huge reductions in income to many diaconal service providers. For example, organizations that work within a social economy model have seen, for example, secondhand clothes shops closed down, have seen workshops and other forms of employment, sheltered employment closed down during the pandemic, which has had a massive reduction in income. We're also seeing uh, burnout and mental health issues amongst staff. And there's also been a reduction of volunteers in many church related diaconal activity. But of course, in the wider society, we're also seeing uh, some impacts. And I think it's also important to say now, we don't know what the long term impact of COVID-19 is going to be socioeconomically. We're still in the midst of the pandemic, but already we are seeing higher levels of unemployment, particularly those who have been placed on furlough. Um, or short time working. We're seeing digital and data poverty, particularly amongst younger people and um, lower income families who don't have the same access to broadband or internet um, or computer facilities. We have seen um, the, the impact that school at home has had on many young people. Of course, mental health and um, worry has been a big issue. And indeed the question of debt and people who are living without their usual income are often the, the very close to debt. And the final um, point I would say about socioeconomic impacts is loneliness and isolation. Um, and even the most, uh, some of the most well-off in our societies can face loneliness and isolation because of the pandemic. So what's the response been? And this is just where I want to conclude in this first section. I think for many diaconal organizations, we have had to find new ways of working, moving our work online, reduction in some services, but also recognising the greater need for investment in, in providing care um, in a holistic way, as well as having greater focus on holistic well-being, identifying both physical and mental health issues, addressing issues of loneliness. And I think what we have seen more and more is that diaconal services and the approach that churches have to serving their community, it needs to be agile, not fragile. It needs to be agile to be able to change to the needs of the society. But we've also seen new volunteers coming forward. We've seen a greater sense of purpose in staff and volunteers. And perhaps I would just conclude this first uh, short section by saying, I also believe there has been a greater recognition of the role of the church and diaconia in repairing, in, in strengthening the social fabric of our society. And that gives us hope going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. I think that was a, you are a role model for other speakers <laughs> uh, keeping time in this way. Uh, you will have an opportunity to speak uh, a little bit later. I will conduct a brief interview with you. So I will, I will skip uh, asking additional questions to your presentation now to keep up with time. Uh, and go straight to our next uh, presentation, Hans-Peter Bocholt, uh, who will speak on the impact of, on people with disabilities. 
Hans Peter, the floor is yours. Your Grace, Archbishop Veyret, um, dear General Secretary, Dr. Sorensen, dear audience, sisters and brothers, the impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities. I was asked to share some grassroots experiences and that was fine with me. But the longer I thought about it, I felt a bit uneasy. My life is comparatively comfortable in terms of living and secure income. I could do my work as a pastor during the last year. Sure, it's a bit tricky for me to put on uh, 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 the mask to, to put on and off um, and then not to be able to use the mouth as a sort of third hand for me. And there was and is a slight uneasiness about being infected by the disease and a high risk of that for me that made and makes me often hesitate to leave home. Thus, I would have wished a more rigid COVID strategy by the state, as many others too, with a handicap or not. So who I am to measure the impact on, of COVID-19 on people with disabilities. There are other people with handicaps who in my perspective are much more affected by this disease. I think of N, a man mid 50 who in his um, early childhood was infected by meningitis Thus, he can utter only single tones, still very vividly express his feelings. He lives in a home for persons with severe mental handicaps. During the first lockdown, he for four months was not allowed to leave this home, which means uh, not visiting or seeing his mother and not going to the sh his sheltered workshop. When they had COVID-19 cases in the home, he was even locked just in his room. It took some time until it was possible for him to go back to work. And he still only goes to work every second week for safety reasons. I talked to his mother these days. She was, in difference to what I was uh, what I expected relaxed. Her son and well, uh, her son was with her for a few days visit, visit. Both have gotten vaccinated, but perhaps had an impact. And he sounded happy too when I talked to him on the phone. She also spoke very mildly about the four months when I asked about them for that home, she excused it. And for the workshop, it was a new situation and difficult and they had not known better. I did not argue. Still, I would say COVID-19 has put some extra burden on people with disabilities to which I count myself. There is an increased vulnerability and a greater fear of it. Isolation in society means more isolation to us. The race for the new and for few and lacking resources means easily to leave, be left behind. I think of a mother who was wondering that she and many others around her got an invitation to the to be vaccinated, but her grown-up child with severe a severe handicap and a stated higher risk was forgotten. I wished society would see that much more. On the other hand, society is very loud at the moment in Germany, and I could imagine in other countries too. Thus, I first of all 
with a focus of hearing and inviting to hear and on helping to be heard. The WCC Central Committee document, The Gift of Being, was, has quote, quoted a slogan, nothing about us without us. It's a good uh, guideline to the pilgrimage of justice and peace, also in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Reverend uh, Bocholt. I, I noticed you say that you, you would wish for, for more rigid uh, government measures. Uh, I think in many European uh, states these days, we, uh, we hear of, 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 uh, of, of less of, of measures. Uh, would you say that there is a, a, a gap developing uh, between uh, the general public and people with, uh, with disabilities in this, in this sense? To, to, what, to what I hear, uh, uh, and my own feeling is that there is a gap. That's, yes. It would be better to have it more down and um, than to open. There are uh, different interests for sure, but uh, from my pers perspective, I would wish that. Yes, thank you so much. I think maybe we can return to this later, this uh, added marginalization, you could call it in, in this case, uh, for, for a particular group of, of our citizens. We will uh, move on to our third presentation this afternoon. And uh, uh, for that, we have Father Stavros Kofinas, uh, representing the Ecumenical Patriarchate for Pastoral Healthcare. Uh, and uh, you will speak this afternoon to us on health and in particular on anti-vaccine propaganda. And uh, as everybody else, you have available uh, four or five minutes. Let's see if we can make it within that time frame. Please, Father Kofinas. Thank you for inviting me. Our health, physical, psychological, and spiritual, defines the way we interact in the experiences of life. The healthy person who feels real and alive is able to incorporate his and her being into the whole to be a significant part of a universal experience that is not centered around oneself without feeling that personal autonomy, genuineness, and a sense of worth is at stake. Thus, one's existential fulfillment as a person is determined on how one participates interacts, coexists in the Catholicity of being. To fully participate in this Catholicity, one has to develop and maintain a sense of ontological security, a basic sense of trust that will allow one to cope with the enemies that threaten life, the greatest being death. Without a sense of security and trust, the circumstances of daily life will be a living threat, sheer hell, and one will have to contrive ways to preserve a sense of being. One will form one's own world in which he or she will be able to fully control as to preserve one's autonomy and identity so that the enemy will not evade and destroy one's sense of being. An inner threat is often projected as an outer enemy that needs to be defeated. Such a defensive reaction harbors fear to the point of paranoia, anger, and a type of group or tribal isolation or separateness. It is necessary for us to understand these dynamics to be able to understand why there has been such an adverse reaction to the way many have dealt with the pandemic that has come upon us. When these dynamics are coupled with the immediate threat of death, a feeling of social injustice and discrimination, a lack of education or misinformation, they become explosively dangerous. The anti-vaccination propaganda that we're witnessing is, is an overt expression of this phenomenon. It is based on the need to have full control of what enters our body in fear of the unknown. The propagators are arguing to preserve their ontological beings so as not to be engulfed into the masses. It cultivates a denial of death and the need to feel omnipotent, something that Western societies have cultivated for years. 
considering this, such a phenomenon, such a movement is inevitable. The growing fundamentalistic trend that is characterizing many faith communities has become part of the anti-vaccine propaganda because in essence, these communities express the dynamics of the unhealthy psychological and social makeup of those that adhere to them. Although they profess a total faith in a God that will protect them from all dangers, in practice, they breathe mistrust both in life and man. They cultivate doubt and shame in the fear of condemnation, the fear of ostracization from the group that will protect them from all evil. After the pandemic ends, we as faith communities will have to deal seriously with these fundamentalistic trends that undermine health on all levels of human existence, cause division on all levels of society and distort the possibilities of establishing a healthy faith in God. This will be our greatest challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Kufinas. I wonder if this, uh, I think the, the anti-vaccine uh, 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 movement uh, that we're, well, it's been around as a movement for some years, but the uh, what we see now, of course, is an is an um, enhanced uh, focus on 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 vaccination and also therefore also on on the uh, anti-vaccination movement. Is it your experience that we see uh, a particularly uh, uh, a strong voice from within our our churches, or or how is that? As I said, the, the churches that, that cultivate this for me are the closed communities that are, have fundamentalistic uh, basis. Uh, and and that is, they are made up of, of a, a certain type of personality for me. And that's the dangerous part. Yes. And that has to deal with the ones, this has to, go, this has to deal with the one's development as a human being from childhood and how he experiences dangers. Yes. Thank you for sharing this with us, uh, uh, Father Kofinas. It's, uh, it's an important issue and an important question to deal with uh, within, within our churches and also in society as such, that's for sure. Uh, I would like to call on uh, Heather Roy once more, because uh, <laughs> you have been given a bit of extra space this afternoon for, uh, for a a small, or oh, I have been given a bit of extra space for a small interview with you, uh, to um, to break out from the uh, from the uh, the panelists' intervention, so to speak. Heather, it's um, now you you touched upon uh, this in your in your presentation. Also, the uh, I think you said that the the level of uh, of volunteers or the number of volunteers within uh, within churches and and diaconal organisations has actually uh, gone up during this crisis, which of course is a is a very positive sign. Uh, on the other hand, I, we also know that uh, the traditional, uh, uh, how should I say, that if you look at, at at people who volunteer in our churches, they would very often belong to some of the more vulnerable groups, like elderly people. Uh, so, uh, how do you? What is your experience with this? Has has this had an impact on on the capability of our, our churches and diaconal organizations to help? Uh, and has this, in fact, led to to uh, you know to new uh, volunteers uh, showing up in in churches and organizations to give a hand? How do you see this? I, absolutely, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think when the the, the pandemic first started and there was that initial sort of shutdown and lockdown. Many, as you say, volunteers might have been in elder, older age groups who were seen as being more vulnerable and who had to shield or had to stay stay inside or, or take take more care. And, and I think there was a period where there was this question about, do we have enough people? Do we have enough volunteers? And of course, that also is staff um, working in diaconal care homes as, as well as staff and volunteers. But what we've heard from some of our members is that then new volunteers started to come forward. Younger people, perhaps who were on furlough and looking for something to do. Um, people who recognized that there is an element of solidarity in our societies that I think has been brought to the fore actually through this pandemic. Um, and, and therefore were willing to offer their time 
when they could. So I think we, we've seen the, both sides of it, but I can also just say from, a, from a, a, a diaconal project that I'm personally involved in, we have seen a greater increase of, of young people coming forward as volunteers in the last eight months than we did in the previous year that we were operating. So that's uh, that's that's good. To, it's, of course, it's interesting to see whether we can we can keep these people uh, as 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 active volunteers. That's a that's a question, of course. But well, let's hope that that will be the uh, the case. I, I, I not least because I we know that our governments have spent you know uh, huge amounts on uh, on this crisis. Uh, for various reasons and for good reasons as well, for sure. Uh, at the same time, the uh, the tax revenues in some of our our nations have have gone down, also because of the uh, uh, of of the uh, of the crisis and and what came with it. Do you foresee that churches will have to uh, carry a, a larger part of uh, diaconal work or, or social work in in uh, in Europe in the future? Uh, and in, if you do, uh, how do you see the prospects for this? Are we equipped as churches and organizations to take on that? Uh, I wouldn't say a new role. It's, it's more like an old role, really. But this uh, renewed role as, as, uh, as uh, social workers in our, in our countries. I think, it, it, again, there's sort of two answers to that. One is that the, the economic situation is obviously of concern. But there's also choices that can be made by governments about where they put their spending. And I think one of the things that we, we've recognised is that uh, social care, social work, diaconal work, which has usually been, frankly, undervalued, under-recognised and under-resourced, has now been recognised as being absolutely essential in our society, whether it be um, secular or organised by religious communities, by churches. It's now seen as being absolutely essential. Now, the question will be whether future government spending will reflect that and we'll see greater investment in social work, in healthcare, et cetera. Um, as we see, for example, the, the greater um, awareness of mental health um, and the need to, to invest more in mental health services, but as well as ensuring that we don't go back into, which is, I think, also what one of the previous speakers was talking about, there's been increased medicalization of people during this, this crisis, um, particularly people with disabilities. Uh, they've been treated as medical cases, and that has also restricted human rights and mm -hmm. social rights for many people. And so I think for the, the churches, for diaconia, yes, we might, we might have to continue to provide these services, but we also have to use our voice and say, where does investment need to go in our societies? So we have to be prophetic mm -hmm. as well as practical. We yes. have to do both and, and speak out, identify the gaps and ask for structural and systemic change. We can't go back to business as usual. We need to say, what is the shape our economy needs to take if we're going to be resilient as people and communities to future crises? And that's a big question now. I think we are in a transition period where as within the last year or so, we've been in, uh, in a situation where we had to respond immediately to what we were seeing. Uh, now has come the time or has been here for maybe for a, for a short while where we need to look into the future and see what will be the new normal. Uh, talking about going back to normality, maybe a bit of an over-exaggeration, we will go back to a new normality, which we don't really know what is yet, but which we have to prepare us for anyhow. So thank you for, for sharing this with us, uh, uh, Heather. Um, I think it, it's helpful to get the, these aspects and perspectives um, on the situation also. It's now time for a short video uh, from UNICEF. Uh, I believe it will be shared by my colleagues from the WCC. Uh, yes, I think we can run this now. So on some of the people that are also uh, severely hit by the, the current crisis, please. Защото преди това ние виждахме, че имаме проблем. Не говореше, не издаваше сръчки, само звуци. Неговото разстройство е от аутистични аспекта. Автономността, уменията също изоставаха за неговата възраст. Вече е много по-спокоен, психомоторно и двигателно е много по-координиран.
ние знаем, че всъщност най-голямата инвестиция, която човечеството прави, е инвестицията в а, ранното детство. so much. Obviously for families who have to travel with their children for treatment of various parts have been hard, hit hard by, by the current crisis where we have uh, been discouraged from moving around. So um, this is a good example of, uh, of one family that has been uh, hit by, by, the, uh, by the measures taken uh, during COVID-19 crisis. I will, uh, this was a video from UNICEF and our next speaker is uh, is also representing unicef it is uh, philip cory uh deputy regional director unicef regional office for europe and central asia and uh philip you will speak uh in particular on the impact of on children related also to the video that we have just seen so please uh, philip the floor is yours yeah thank you so much actually we build on what either said you know it's the time to invest uh in systems that are resilient for the most vulnerable. I mean, education system, health system, protection system, we are not functioning for the most vulnerable in times of crisis. Uh, the Roma child, the child with disability, the, the child in institution, the child from the poorest household, the migrant child, we're not accessing to these services. No, any form of learning, not even immunized, not even having the proper care, uh, even a victim of violence, stigmatization during this crisis of the pandemic, and it's still unfolding. As you know, tomorrow, the social summit of the EU is starting uh, for two days at the heads of state level. So this is why we have a whole tweeting campaign that we are and also in partnership with uh, the World Council of Churches, faith-based organization around the investment case uh, for children. Uh, we, you know, we need to be um, moving in terms of system, sustainable funding, so uh, that you know you could have really um, a, a long-lasting approach to to this uh, resilience. So definitely, we are piloting with the uh, European Commission a financing facility called the Child Guarantee that has been approved by the European Parliament. Uh, vastly, I must say, uh, and we hope that the Council, uh, the 27 member states of the European Union, by the end of the year, will actually, uh, after the Council conclusion, approve this uh, financing facility. So it's really funding that will be available for public policies uh, of governments in terms of uh, you know, children programs uh, in relation to this uh, resilience of systems, in terms of, in terms of alle alleviation of poverty. This COVID-19 is probably generating now uh, beyond the 22 million children already at risk of social exclusion, more than 6 million children again, that are going to be uh, falling into poverty in, in the years to come because of the socioeconomic impact uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic. So that, that is really for us a, a very important. We have to, to break the cycle of disadvantage very early on in, in the early years. Uh, and you need systems for that, for early child education. I mean, giving the access to some form of learning to the most vulnerable, uh, knowing that probably this on-off type of, um, uh, you know, systems of uh, online, you know, that is not given to the most vulnerable. You know, the children in, uh, in middle-class families could somehow access to some form of learning uh, through uh, online classes and so on. But the most vulnerable uh, had for close to more than half of a year and some uh, close to a year, no form of learning of any kind. So this is really uh, something that will affect their own capacity to, to grow in societies. Uh, and integrate in the society. So that's really a, a major issue there. Uh, and uh, when it comes to health, obviously the, uh, the fact that the health system has been completely uh, paralyzed by this COVID-19 pandemic uh, you know, response, uh, simple routine immunization were not even carried out. So it means that hundreds of thousands of children in Europe were not immunized against polio, measles, uh, and Thai cohort have been missed. This is very serious what's happening. Uh, and even uh, maternal uh, health was very much challenged and neonatal uh, care was also challenged. So those, those are very serious uh, dimensions that we need to, uh, to work on to have uh, and build this uh, resilient system. Again, the child guarantee could be helping governments to do so. Uh, and that's really what it is all about. Uh, and that's uh, a second level. And uh, colleagues mentioned the uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, and it's really a huge issue. Uh, and I'm glad that we have this partnership with a faith-based organization because you can really do a lot uh, there. I mean, vaccinations we know as UNICEF as the, one of the largest, if not the largest provider of vaccines in the developing world, that it saves two to three million lives of children uh, a year. So that cannot be denied. 
So we, we need to be careful because this uh, anti-vax movement, as, uh, as it is called, could really jeopardize, uh, you know, all these international committee uh, years of investment to prevent polio, to prevent measles. I mean, we have seen re uh, resurgences of this disease that we are, you know, almost um, extinct extinguished. So that's really a very serious what's happening in terms of uh, backfiring on all these uh, uh, investment made by the international community to immunize children. Next year is also very important because next year you will probably have uh, vaccines available for children. So we need really to be strong there and UNICEF is going to be certainly pushing, uh, you know, a strong position there because we, we cannot just um, let it be like this. We don't want to stigmatize uh, anti-vaxxers. Very often is wrong information, uh, people in doubt, and some are really professional in you know, instilling the doubts in young mothers and, and families. So it's really, uh, instead of polarizing, uh, we prefer to uh, you know, try to explain, provide access to the right information to reassure, uh, and so that uh, families, parents in particular, young parents and young people uh, understand the value of uh, vaccination. So a battle that we are very happy to continue to, uh, to undertake with you. And I know we have uh, vaccination champions in, in, uh, across faith-based organizations. We are working around the ethics of vaccination, you know, the access to, to vaccines for all, not only within, but also uh, societies, but also across countries, developing or developed is very important. And UNICEF with the COVAX initiative has done uh, everything it could there because that's very serious. And hopefully the licensing fee, now we see the US administration making some statement in that regard could be a, an opening that would uh, you know, give more access uh, uh, to, to this vaccine. So we have seen an impact. So increased poverty, uh, health has been impacted, education has been impacted, but we have seen also um, parents completely struggling uh, because in this lockdown, you know, um, with children, I mean, uh, 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 having, uh, a situation where they still wanted their children to learn something. To um, it was very uh, stressful, uh, and mental health is not also mental health for children and adolescents, but also of parents. Uh, that was really affected in, in this lockdown situation, and we have seen many uh, rise of violence uh, within household, even against children, and gender-based violence, as you all know. So that that creates that um, you know lockdown and situation anxiety raised by by this pandemic situation really uh, was uh, you know, a trigger for more violence and more abuse of children and women uh, across societies. And we have seen uh, across Europe uh, alarming figures of the rise of this uh, child abuse. Uh, and it's really serious and we need, it will be you know, challenging and we need you, a faith-based organization, to, um, to help us down now downgrade the, the, the rise that we have seen. And, and you are value-based and, and your outreach uh, in communities is certainly uh, valued and, and will be extremely useful in, in that regard. And we have seen also further stigmatization. Myself, I visited several reception camps of the migrants, particularly child migrants, you know, the, the, like, you know, they are the vector of the disease uh, uh, coming to Europe. Uh, and that was really uh, challenging. And you, you have about 12,000, you know, children and accompanied minors. Uh, and separated uh, from the families that were, you know, really stigmatized. And we had really to, um, even with some governments, to explain that, uh, you know, you have also to, uh, to take into account this consideration. Uh, and we need to work together. And the partnership we have, uh, the platform with faith-based organization against the, the stigma uh, of the migrant child is really important. Again, it's a value-based approach. Uh, and in your communities, this is a, a way to change perception, you know, with the tolerance, dignity, uh, and those are values that are the most important. So really a lot to do together uh, and, uh, you know, making that investment case, we, we need systems, we, we don't need charity, we need systems to be in place, because this is a right. Uh, and fundamentally, when we speak about peace, uh, it goes through social cohesion and social cohesion goes through social inclusion. So we need to have this system facilitating the social inclusion that is needed ultimately for peace and social cohesion of our society. So it's, it's about that. Uh, and this is why we, we try to convince and with your help, this government's meeting uh, in the next two days in, in Porto, uh, online or in Porto physically, uh, at the heads of state level. So it's the time to tweet and retweet this investment case uh, for children because this is uh, what it is all about, is uh, systems, budget access, uh, and engagement of governments, uh, understanding that uh, breaking the cycle of uh, disadvantage is the best way to, uh, to build social cohesion in your own society. I'll stop there to leave more time for colleagues.
Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I will. I will. Uh, I will not ask you any further questions at this stage. But there will be some questions relating to what you you have been saying. I think uh, they are uh, being raised in the chat here and also uh, in our YouTube ca channel. I re I re uh, uh, I call on everyone who has a, a question or a comment to what is being said to share that with us, and uh, we will see uh, whether we can include that in the question and answer session at the end of the. Uh, of the of the panel session. Uh, thank you, Philippe, uh, for sharing this with us. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a gloomy uh, or an optimistic picture you're painting of the future. Again, I think we can say we're in a transition period where we hardly know what is, uh, we, we're just about getting used to what is happening now, but, but it we find it very difficult to really to plan for the future because we, 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 we know so little about what will be the, you know, the true consequences of what we're seeing right now. Um, I will move on to the uh, next presentation, which is by Nicole Borisuk, um, originally from Germany, but now living in Ukraine, uh, heading the Christian faith-based uh, NGO Living Hope in Ukraine since 1999. And uh, you will speak to us about poverty. Nicole, the yes. floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm representing not only Living Hope, our grassroots organization, but also Interdia, which is a learning community for Christian social action and living community in Eastern and Central Europe. This academy has three pillars, which are learning, research, and networking. And during this time, it was a real um, source of, of impact to the grassroots organizations, which we are representing. The crisis connected to COVID-19 has already increased poverty in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as in many other parts of the world, and is continuing to affect the daily life of millions of people in our communities. The pandemic exacerbates inequality, injustice, and poverty in our region and highlights the shortcomings of the systems we live in and the vulnerability of certain people groups. It also highlights the urgent need to rethink the structures we live and work in and of course, the structures we have built in our Christian communities and ministries. Some people say the safety measures are, and regulations are the same for everyone, for the rich and the poor, but they forget that the reality of people living in poverty is much more challenging and cruel, and that the life of people having uh, a decent income is much more comfortable. Housing conditions, food supply, income, internet access, and availability of healthcare are different, and make injustice and inc exclusion more visible. It makes a difference if you face lockdown measures owning your own special house or living in a rented one bedroom apartment as a single mother with three children. 69% of Ukrainians have experienced the economic impact of COVID-19, according to a survey commissioned by UNICEF. Almost a third of respondents reported losing their jobs while over half spent their savings and cut their expenses for food. Mostly impacted are people uh, from um, the following groups, elderly people, people living with disabilities, women, especially single mothers, and older women in rural isolated or conflict affected areas. Also workers and micro, small and me medium sized entrepreneurs. Also ethnic minorities like Roma minority and people living in homelessness or people living in institutionalized systems. As faith-based organizations, we are committed to pay attention to the physical, emotional and spiritual well-being of our neighbors. Having a holistic approach has guided us through these challenging times and helped us to grow in the process of facing and tackling poverty in our communities. We are called to find new forms, new ways of conviviality, the art and practice of living together with people living in poverty despite of social distancing and fear. In the following, I want to share some insights from my practice here in Ukraine from the experiences we make on our journey. Many people in our communities approached and continue to approach us with their physical and mental needs and material needs. People are asking for food, medicine, housing payments, payment for healthcare. As Christians, we believe that we are called to share our resources with people facing poverty. Usually we took a participatory approach in our ministry, rather teaching people how to fish instead of giving out fish. 
but COVID-19 has forced us to establish an emergency fund for food supply. The new reality depriving the income demanded from us the willingness to rethink our approaches and strategies according to our mission and values. During the first total lockdown, we have delivered more than 1,000 food packages to families and elderly people in need. We organized means of transport to, to be close to the people and help them li literally to survive. Since summer 2020, we are allowed to keep our daycare community centers open. And monthly, we provide more than 1,000 hot meals for children and young people coming from disadvantaged families. We pay more attention now to the fact to cook healthy, balanced meals understanding that the families cannot afford certain expensive groceries. The remaining food is given away as well. Nothing is wasted. But coming to the daycare centers is much more value for the children, young people and families than just receiving food. The sense of belonging, the welcoming atmosphere and the opportunity to share what they are going through is at least equally valuable. Common prayer, face-to-face -face Bible studies, small meetings have become more precious to our fellowships. Enabling families who did not have internet to join meetings online is another important step in finding ways out of poverty. Many children and young people in our context were unable to attend distance learning. We made it one of our priorities to change this for the people in our program and in a rather short period of time, most of them were able to use the internet. Now we are offering blended activities with some people meet face to face while others from rural areas or even other countries can join in online. This is one of the big gains from the crisis and something we are thankful for. In conclusion, we believe that Christian community is called to be a lighthouse in these confusing and demanding times. By walking alongside people whose challenges have grown during the pandemic, we learn new ways of convivial life together. Every crisis builds opportunities. For us, the opportunity to, to evaluate and question existing structures and approaches and develop applicable participative ways to support change in our communities, giving a voice to people facing poverty and marginalization with the aim to contribute to social justice and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole for sharing this, um, this uh, with us, uh, witnessing to a situation in, in Eastern Europe. Would you say, you say that the churches have played a role here, of course, that's, uh, that's inherent in what you're saying. Have you experienced, uh, uh, or could you give examples of, of cooperation between uh, the churches and the government in, in, uh, in, in fighting or combating this, uh, this crisis? I think, um the cooperation between uh, churches and state uh, in Ukraine is quite difficult. Uh, there's a big gap between these two structures. And of course, we are invited to certain roundtables to, to speak about strategies, but there is a big gap uh, or a big step to take until implementation. And yeah, it's some area that needs to be improved very much in, in our context, in Ukrainian context, the uh, cooperation with the state. I think everyone is doing his own work um, and this is yeah, something that needs to be improved. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our next presentation, before we will have a, a brief video uh, clip, we will have a presentation by uh, Maria Sonnleitner uh, from Austria, representing um, the Ecumenical Youth Council in Europe today. And you will speak on uh, long-term consequences for young people, and in particular with, uh, with regard to mental health. So we look forward to your presentation. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you for inviting me and giving young people the chance to be heard a bit. Um, I want to start off by telling you that this is a difficult topic for me um, because I personally have been affected by the pandemic in several ways. On one hand, I'm a youth worker, meaning I work for a congregation, for a Lutheran congregation, um, where I've experienced young people hurting for over a year with no improvements or very little improvement to the situation. On the other hand, I'm a young person myself. I am 20 years old and every young person I know I have experienced has experienced some sort of mental health issue in the last year 
including myself. There, so it's really hard, the whole topic in itself. And I cannot, I, the promise is it's about long-term consequences. I can tell you what I've known so far because I'm not an expert on what will be coming. I can tell you what I experienced in my work and in my personal life. Um, and something that I wanna focus on is an aspect that affects mental health in young people a lot. And it's something everyone can relate to and is very crucial and I think constantly overlooked and that is community. Um, because we all miss community, if we're being honest. But I would argue young people miss community a bit more. Um, I, show, I want to show you this through my own example. Before the pandemic, it, I had a very vibrant social life. I was outside of my apartment every day, was at university, I was studying, I was with people, I had meetings with all sorts of friends and I had no reason to be in my apartment because my apartment was there to sleep and that's what it, that's what it was for more or less. Now the pandemic hit and I was in my apartment alone for weeks with no end. And that was hard, it was really, really hard. And it was hard not only for myself, but it was also hard because I was not able to go to my friends because they were struggling as well. My whole social system, my whole support system was struggling. And this is, I'm not the only one who experienced this. This is what young people experienced throughout this pandemic because one thing that young people have in common is that their so social system consists of friends because one aspect of being a young person is to find support and find social connections outside of family. That's an important part of development of young people. And now this social system that they have built up is breaking down in small ways and is not there to support them in the way that they're used to and that they need, um, which then again, affected mental health. Like if we look at um, depression, depression in young people has been rising over the last decade, like a lot. We all know this, um, but it has worsened in the pandemic. I know that in Austria alone, the number of young people which has been hospitalized um, for mental health problems has doubled. And yet you need to keep in mind that those are the most severe cases. We're not talking about the ones that um, are, just like have slight mental health problems, don't, you know, have, don't miss motivation to get up in the morning. And in many cases, we have a stigma. If young people are affected by this, they have hopefully a, a, a family that support them. But if there's the stigma that where's the family just say, like, hmm, it's just a thing, just get over it. Um, that's not helping. And what comes with this is if you're not taking seriously about the issues that you have, um, then going further and finding support somewhere else is also an issue. But if you overcome all those obstacles, then there is this next big issue, which enrages me so massively, which is in Austria, there is basically no support if you want to go, go and have um, support for your mental health struggles. The state of Austria does not support anything. Um, I have witnessed this with friends and with family and with young people that I work with where they overcame all those obstacles and finally decided that they need to find help and they needed to give up because they were not able to support, to pay those, uh, this fee of approximately 100 euro per session to, for a mental health specialist because there is no support for the Austrian social state. And I live in a social country, so I would think that there should be support, but there's not. And it makes me really, really, really angry. Um, and I don't see any change coming and it's frustrating being honest. Something else that is, is interesting is that in Aust Austrian media, I don't know how, how it is in other countries, but Austrian media says that the young generation is the so-called new lost generation. It's the generation that misses out on all those fun things young people are supposed to do, like party and experience the world and have fun and revel. And they're stuck at home, not doing anything. Um, yet one thing young people do not want to be called is lost. Because if you're calling them lost, you're denying them the opportunity not to be lost. 
and to think about their hopes and their dreams and also voice their worries and being taken serious about their worries. And I do not know how it is in other places in Austria, but I know in Europe, but I know that in Austria, they don't get their, their voices to be heard. Politics has been focusing so much on older people and on the economy that young people feel forgotten. When it comes to young people, the main focus is still on education. And which means you are, you're limiting the role of young people to students. And if a young person is not a student, they're forgotten. They fall through the cracks. And young people have to this day very little political representation. So it's very easy to forget them. Um, young people in Austria don't want to feel lost. They don't want to be the lost generation, but they feel forgotten. And it is ironic because everywhere in politics, in media, even in churches, there was young people always hear, you are the future. Yet they are being ignored, maybe until the future finally arrives. We don't know. Um, yet it's not mine to say that young people have it harder than others. We all of us are suffering and all of us are missing community, but we need to keep in mind how important community is for young people, for their development, for their support system, for their mental health. Young people do not need to be educated, but they need their support system, their friends and their community back. It's so vital. And of course, there's so many other issues that come with the pandemic and have long-term effects and consequences that come with it. Like, uncertainty and being afraid about the future, anxiety that comes with that, unemployment, losing out on education or losing out on once in a lifetime opportunities. But there is only so much I can cover in four to five minutes and I'm already over time. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, want to, uh, I want to finish this by saying that through this pandemic, I've been very pessimistic about this issue, very, being very honestly, and I still am. Young people are being vaccinated last or being not being vaccinated at all because they're too young. They might be vaccinated in the future, we don't know. The relief people are feeling in Europe and seeing the end of the pandemic is not something that necessarily shared by young people. And I'm sorry that I have to end on such a dire note, but as I said in the beginning, this is a difficult topic for me, especially since it's been hard to be so very hopeful this year. But we are talking about young people. And if there's one thing that I've learned working with young people, that there's always a grain of hope in most situations, even in the most dire ones. Thank you very much, Maria. That is very true. There's always a grain of hope. That is true. Uh, one question that you can answer with a yes or a no, even though you say that you're not, uh, you're not capable of saying a lot about how the future will be, what the long-term effects will be. Do you think this, uh, the crisis we've been through through the last uh, year or so, will that increase the what we sometimes call the intergenerational gap? Yes or no? The, the, can the you inter explain? intergenerational gap, the gap between the young and the old of the society. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes we're not able to to uh, to go together, so to speak. But um, will this in, in, enhance the you, you know the the distorted images that the old generation have of the young and the young generation have of the old? Isn't that an issue that has been for ages? Uh, so if it, it, it is, but will the, will this what we've experienced recently will that enhance that situation? Will it will it uh, will it increase this gap? You think? It, I think it depends on how you react to what is happening and if you include young voices. If you don't, then yes, it will. We heard a young voice today. Thank you very much. It was good to have a young voice on the panel also. Uh, we're running slightly behind time schedule. I'm aware of that. If there's someone uh, somewhere behind the screen uh, worrying that we will not make it to the end, but I think we will also within, uh, also within the time frame given more or less at least. Uh, it's time for a video. It's from uh, Torsten Moritz, the uh, General Secretary of the uh, uh, Church's Commission for Migrants in Europe. It's a three minute video and it will start in moments. The picture we have in Europe, of course, is, is differentiated in all the 47 different countries we have on the European continent. But a lot of it looks pretty similar and also similar to other regions of the world. And refugees, migrants arriving in Europe have very great difficulties washing their hands if there's one bathroom to 200 refugees in a camp. Or it's very, very difficult to keep distance, social distance, 
if you're six in a room of eight square meters, that makes it very, very difficult and increases vulnerability. Some people could telework, work from home, but if you're in the service industry, if you're in the care sector, this is very, very difficult. So there's lots of studies which show that black, Asian, minority ethnic people, for example, in the UK are overproportionately affected by COVID, uh, both becoming sick and also dying for it. Lots of migrants and refugees in Europe found themselves all of a sudden behind closed doors and behind closed borders. Many European countries closed the borders, wouldn't allow ships to disembark anymore and kept people out. And that's both people coming to seek protection or people who've already been admitted to the territory. Visas were cancelled and similarly. So we did have a lot of issues of scapegoatism, first towards Asian people, then any kind of migrants. And of course, there were many, many problems related to the existence of the church. Uh, lots of churches were all of a sudden stopped from their religious practices in a worship. And what we found that international churches or tradition, as they used to be called, migrant churches were particularly affected by it, no longer being able to meet on a Sunday, no longer being able to do collections. So it very much impacted the life of refugees, migrants, people on the move in general, but also the churches and communities they're part of. We have, of course, seen multiple vulnerabilities for women and children. As it was already said, behind closed doors, there was very, very much an increase in abusive situations, in situations of gender-based violence. And once again, very little of that was publicly seen because it was happening behind closed doors. And we're only now understanding what happened in spring and March. Some of the strategies to, we have chosen was to give visibility, simply saying it's not only COVID. There are still people seeking protection. There are still people looking to, to come to the European continent and they're knocking on our doors and we should respond and not close the eyes and close the borders. It was important that churches so solidarity. Churches in the Netherlands had set up a solidarity fund for, for migrant-led churches to help them pay the rent, for example, because they might not have a church of their own. And what was also important, and I think that's one of the few positive examples, is to say, look what migrants are doing for European society. I would see a chance to rethink some of our relationships. I would see a chance to think coherence in society. But that is something we need to take forward in saying COVID was a warning. Can we come out of it better? So I think that's the challenge we have with the churches and society at large. And I think we should address the difficulties and highlight the chances. Thank you to Torsten Moritz, uh, in particular on the uh, on the challenges for people on the move in our continent, and there among them migrants, migrant workers, migrant churches, international churches. Uh, we will migrate to uh, to the UK now, uh, at least uh, virtually. Uh, Mr. Richard Reddy is uh, there for for us and ready to be uh, on the panel speaking on. Uh, the question whether black and minority ethnic communities have uh, felt a disproportionate impact. Uh, I would say it's, it's to some extent related to what we've just heard from Torsten Moritz also, but I'm sure you can, uh, you can expand on this. Um, Richard, please, the uh, floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, uh, uh, Archbishop and moderator and my uh, fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I'm currently the Director of Justice and Inclusion for Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. And when the COVID-19 outbreak first began, uh, some in Britain said it was a great leveller. They said basically we were all in the same boat. I think what we've recognised uh, since particularly March last year, that we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Um, the... British Minister for Health, Matt Hancock, was forced in June last year to admit that people from ethnic minority backgrounds were disproportionately dying with coronavirus. And it was the case, and research showed that they were uh, catching the virus in uh, larger numbers or greater numbers, and also dying from it. And then according to a, a, a census uh, in Britain, black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, people compose 14.5% of the British population. However, 
uh, when one looked at the first 100 doctors, nurses and care workers to die of COVID-19, out of the 100, 60 were black, Asian and minority ethnic. So you can see the, the disproportionality of the deaths linked to that. And what is more, during the first surge of a pandemic, Office for National Statistics Research found that black people were 1.9 times more likely to die uh, of the coronavirus than white people, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis were 1.8 times more likely to die as white people and Indians 1.5 times more likely to die. Um, and what we also um, uh, recognized was that, you know, this really uh, was a case of um, the virus exacerbating existing socioeconomic inequalities, particularly in the area of health. And, you know, some of the reasons for this were, were many and they were varied. And some people said it was connected to the fact that um, uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic communities live in some of the poorest under, uh, underprivileged uh, neighborhoods in Britain. And that generally they tended to live for cultural reasons in larger families. And these families tended to be uh, multi-generational uh, so that if you know one member of a family uh, caught the virus, it was hard for the rest of them to uh, socially isolate, or hard for that person with the virus to socially isolate. Hence, transmission rates between uh, uh, these families was at an alarming uh, rate. And also during the um, uh, both lockdowns, you know, uh, people living in such uh, accommodation found it hard to uh, access. Uh, gardens and, and green spaces. Um, hence, there, there was this sense of, you know, frustration and that also added to, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerns about uh, people's mental health. Um, what we also uh, saw in research showed, particularly from uh, Black and Asian medical uh, experts, was that, um, you know, if uh, a person was, uh, Black people anywhere, uh, were more likely uh, to have underlying health conditions such as uh, uh, high blood pressure and diabetes and kidney problems. And as such, it made them more susceptible uh, to the virus. And campaigners have long argued that uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic people have had un, uh, unmet health concerns. And all the pandemic did was to expose these shortcomings. And the other issue that uh, came to the fore and that was discussed was the fact that uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, people tended to carry out front facing uh, work. Uh, during the uh, lockdown, particularly the first lockdown, uh, the British government encouraged workers to uh, work from home. Um, statistics or figures showed that a good or a disproportionate number of black, Asian and minority ethnic workers uh, didn't have that particular luxury. They couldn't work from home. They were care workers, they were nurses, they were bus drivers, um, which all made them vulnerable uh, to uh, contracting the virus. And what we also found was that um, many of them were not given adequate um, personal protection equipment, PPE, by their employers. Many of them uh, you know, had to actually buy it themselves. In terms of a church response, one of the things that uh, CTBI encouraged was to bring together uh, doctors, uh, Christian doctors in particular, nurses and medical workers, to ask them their opinion. And what these doctors, nurses and, and medical experts did was to then give advice to uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic workers in terms of how best to protect themselves. And the other thing that we did, we uh, helped to establish a fund uh, by which we would then, which we then sourced PPE from abroad, which was then distributed to workers via churches, community centres, and doctor surgeries. And since the start of this year, um, the churches have been at the forefront of a work to inform and educate people, uh, particularly in Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities, about the vaccine and its uh, its uh, efficacious nature. Let me just say this: that there is a lot of scepticism. Um, within black, Asian and minority ethnic communities about the vaccine. And some of this, I would say, is legitimate. And it's a result of the fact that there is 
very little confidence within certain black communities and Asian communities about the state and that's government, that's the NHS and, and that's other public services. And these are longstanding uh, concerns. And, you know, when the government is encouraging people to, to take up the vaccine, people are very skeptic, you know, people are skeptical, you know, we've, we've mentioned vaccine hesitancy and, and some within those communities are saying, well, we don't want to be guinea pigs. Um, but what we have seen from a church perspective are uh, ministers and clergy and pastors becoming vaccine ambassadors, encouraging congregations to take the jab. And others have actually opened up their churches. So their churches are places where uh, the vaccine can be uh, 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 gained. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I'd like to try and keep to time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, uh, you, you took my question away. I was going to ask about this, uh, the disproportionality when it comes to, to vaccination, uh, uh, the share between uh, black and, and Asian communities and, and, uh, and other communities. But that has, I mean, you've answered that question already. So I will go straight into um, uh, the, the questions from our participants today. Um, thanking all of the per panel participants so far for, for your, uh, for your uh, uh, contributions. We haven't received a whole lot of questions, I have to say, uh, a little handful, so to speak. And I think it's taken also the, the time limits and restraints into consideration. I would try to, uh, uh, to sum up what has come in as questions. I think if, if, I, were to, uh, if I were to set a heading on, on the questions that we have received. Uh, it would be mental health. Uh, a few uh, asking in particular about uh, the state of, of mental health and, and what would be the long-term uh, impact. Uh, obviously the crisis so far has been very much uh, centered around the, the actual disease, COVID-19 uh, COVID and co the Corona virus. But the, the long-term, as we all agree today, we don't, we're not able to look into the future, but I think we would all agree that there are some mental issues that need, uh, need our attention. Uh, how can churches respond? That would be uh, a question that has come up also with a couple of our, our uh, from, from, the, uh, from the audience today. How would churches and how should churches respond to this? Uh, you could say this, this mental health crisis, which might well be the second half of, of the corona crisis or the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, one in particular was raising that question to you, Heather, but I think it, it, it goes for the full panel. So maybe you would start out, Heather, with, with a few words on this and others can, can join in. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think as, as churches and communities of Christians, we have to fight against the existing stigma of mental health. Um, it's not talked about enough in churches. There is still stigma around speaking about your mental health, speaking about depression or, or other uh, situations. So I think that is the first thing we have to do. COVID or no COVID, we've got to, to be uh, much more open about speaking about mental health in, in our churches um, and as Christians. And, and secondly, I think we have to look at how we offer mental health support alongside other areas of support that we do, that holistic well-being. And, and, and thirdly, I, I would say that um, we have the opportunity as churches and diaconia to change the model from waiting for people to come to us for services, for support, and actually be much more um, active in going out into the community and finding people where they are, where they're isolated, where there are... Um, difficult situations and being present alongside them. Thank you, Heather. Good points. Anybody else who would like to? Yes, uh, Father Kofinas. I would like to add to that and also uh, touch on what Maria talked about, that we need to, need to be a little proleptic in our, um, in our churches and form a sense of, of trusting community. <coughs> Uh, where where we can prevent the mental health issues and the family issues before they take place to be there when the when the baby is born and the mother is having the difficulties uh, sometimes we want to intervene after the the destruction has taken place but we have to be there before the destruction takes place. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and it's necessary to form trusting relationships 
uh, in, in doing that. Yeah, sure. We we want that we want people to come to us, but as it was just stated, we have to go to, to people. I think maybe this crisis has also shown what what relationships means. Oh, re what relationships mean to to people. <laughs> Uh, the uh, uh, the measures against movement and um, and how and, relationships or or people are fearful of relationships. Yes, absolutely, that's very true. Would anyone like to anybody else like to to add to this? Um, otherwise, we are getting close. Yes, Maria, you will have. I think you should have the last word on this. Okay. Um... One thing I talked about is community and why I chose community as something that is important is because I believe that one thing that churches are good at is providing community. And I think that they need to use this resource to help people because it is this social structure, this support system that one needs when they are struggling with mental health because just going to the doctor is not helping. There it needs to be a support system and churches can provide the support system. And then it's not dependent on one person, it's dependent on many people. And together it works so much better to help more, one or more person than all by yourself. Yes. I think I will, I will close the, uh, the question and answer session here because, uh, because we need to to, to finish just about uh, in just about 10 minutes or so. Um, I find it interesting that we have, I mean, that some of the, so many of the questions or of the, so many of the few questions we had were, were dealing with, with mental health, mental health, and also seeing this as a, as a long-term impact on the crisis we've had. I think it shows that uh, what we've been talking about today, it witnesses to the fact that, that we are beginning to look into the future on how to, to cope with the, uh, with the long-term impact. Uh, which is not directly related to uh, this particular disease, but which is, uh, which is, in fact, real long-term impact on our societies, on our, uh, on our communities, um, on our churches, on individuals. Uh, and, and I think the role of the church, I think it's brilliantly said by you, Maria, that there is, uh, this is a place for community. And, and as, as we said before, the, the relationship between people, the importance of that also in, in healing um, uh, amongst, amongst people. And then Maria, you said also, uh, you finished your, your, uh, your, your own presentation by saying there's always a grain of hope. I think that is true. And I think that as churches, we should, uh, we should be witnessing to that grain of hope, which is there. Uh, maybe that's the, the most significant uh, contribution that we can have as churches in this situation. With these words, I would like to finish my part of, of the afternoon as the moderator. Uh, thank you to the World Council of Churches for asking me to do this and for setting up this, um, uh, this uh, webinar. And I will hand over uh, the word to Dr. Isabel Beatty, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure for me just to be part of this conversation and to try to capture what you have discussed and put it in a bigger picture. Because, you know, the World Council of Churches, you know, decided that, you know, we should have a series of um, conversations on what COVID-19, you know, means to us and uh, whilst we are on the pilgrimage of justice and peace. Last week, we had one consultation, you know, for the African region. And this week, here we are with the European region consultation. And I must admit that the issues are the same. Maybe the emphasis is different, but they are the same. It was mental health issue, which was key. And I see that, you know, repeated again and again. In, in this consultation. Another issue that was also picked up in the African region was the importance of community, right? And I hear the same in this group that, you know, community is important. And having UNICEF here uh, and, you know, other NGOs, I see the importance of partnership. And indeed, you know, partnership should be key in what we are doing 
because we need each other in order to do more in the communities you know, where God has put us. And I also see transformation of the churches that you know, this is not a time for us to pull back, but to engage more, to go out and be with the people because we've, through COVID we've learned that church is not a building, it's the people and the people are, we continued you know, having church in our houses and after COVID, let us continue with that spirit and go out into the community and be church with the people there. And uh, as part of the pilgrimage of justice and peace, let me just say that, you know, this is a methodology of framing the work that we do. And I, I could see, you know, how well, you know, we have articulated our issues within this framework of the pilgrimage of justice and peace. Very soon, the World Council of Churches will have a, an assembly in Europe. And this concept of a pilgrimage of justice and peace started at the 2013 assembly of the World Council of Churches, which was in Asia. And the idea was that he, let's focus on a few issues and then see how that develops as we move from one continent to another. So they identified the issues of peace building, economic justice, climate change, human dignity as you know, the key issues. And then from one year to another, we've been focusing on the different regions, uh, the eight regions of the World Council of Churches. And as we move from one region to another, we see the experience of the people focusing on specific issues, one of which is trauma. And in this conversation, we could see how trauma is coming up as a result of COVID-19. The other issue was the uh, uh, um, displacement of people. In this conversation, We've also seen how the migrants have a specific experience of uh, COVID-19. And then the other issue that came up was gender justice. In this conversation, we've also heard how violence against women has increased during this period of COVID-19. And the other one is the issue of racism. And although that one has come up only in the case of UK, we know that this is a broader problem. It's a European problem, just as it is an Asian problem, Pacific problem, African problem, American problem, and Latin American problem. So it's a global issue that we are struggling with. As we go to the assembly uh, in Europe 2022, we still want to focus on the pilgrimage of justice and peace for Europe. And there we want to look at the truth and the trauma. And we also want to look at the gender justice, especially in the context of Eastern Europe. And again, everything is done within the assembly theme. And now I would like us to look at the video that he promotes the assembly.
you and thank you to Europe for hosting, for being our host for the assembly. Yes, and then I was asked to sum this up. And I think um, everything that has been said today gives a new and vibrant meaning of the old prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.